And the second paper is, well, sorry, uh, and this is based, uh, th these papers are in collaboration with Gabriel Cuomo, Mark Mezze, and Aviara Viv Moshe. And I'll also dedicate a few slides at the end to uh, upcoming work, uh, which is also joined by Ofer Aharoni, uh, which is more focused on Wilson Nines. So uh, line defects uh, in quantum field theory, you can think about them in two ways, and these two ways are complementary and useful sometimes. One is that you can think about it as a point like impurity in a Hamiltonian picture. That's how, how condensed matter theorists think about uh, line operators. Or if you like a more Euclidean perspective, you can think about it in d plus one dimensions as a line operator. So I'll be going back and forth between these two uh, ways of thinking about the same thing because they're uh, useful sometimes for various purposes. Also, the, problems, uh, the problem of impurities or line defects in physics has played an immensely important role historically. You might know that Wilson came up with the whole idea of renormalization by, um, by studying impurities in metals. And in fact, that also led to huge progress on integrability through the condo problem and so on. Today, the focus will be on line defects above one plus one dimensions. Historically, most of the work has been in one plus one dimensions, but the emphasis today will be on d plus one dimensions in space time. So d will always stand for the space dimension. So given uh, the setup today will be just for simplicity, I'll assume that the bulk theory is gapless. So it's in a conformal fixed point. And then we're placing some line defect in a gap in a conformal field theory. That would be the setup today. And you can ask, what can such a line defect flow to in a conformal field theory? Usually when we talk about conformal field theories, most of the discussion is about local operators. Not much is known about line operators in general conformal field theories. So that's the subject. So what could be the infrared fate of a line operator? Line operators are defined by some boundary conditions, and then there is probably some RG flow in most cases, and they end up in some infrared uh, phase. So the possible things that could happen in the infrared are uh, perhaps it flows to a true conformal line operator. A, conform, a straight conformal line operator would preserve an SL2R, and that's the, that's the smoking gun signature for a conformal fixed point for a line operator. It could also flow to a completely trivial phase, like the unit line or a topological line, a, a subject which I will not talk much about here. Uh, there could be even more exotic infrared scenarios. Maybe there are other possibilities at long distances other than the first two. And I'll show you one example which, uh, in which a third option appears. I'll just went, make one comment uh, about this, top, this no topological line defect soon, but otherwise I will not talk about it much. So to decide whether a given line operator in some conformal filter flows to a trivial line operator, or perhaps a conformal line operator, or some option, uh, or some yet another option, we have to see what are the available tools in QFT at the moment to decide. So I'll mention three possible general approaches, or three general constraints on this problem. So the first has to do with higher symmetries. So if you have a line operator that is charged under a one-form symmetry, roughly speaking, it cannot flow to a trivial line operator. Uh, this is similar to saying that if you have a local operator which is charged under a normal ordinary symmetry, it cannot be a trivial operator in a conformal field theory. So for line operators, uh, to really prove that a line operator charged under a one-form symmetry cannot flow to a trivial line to a trivial impurity, one has to make another small assumption that the one-form symmetry surfaces cannot be cut open. Uh, I don't want to go into mu too much into that because this is not the subject of today's talk. But uh, one-form symmetry places a constraint on uh, the infrared phases of line operators for sure. Another general constraint come from, comes from the bootstrap. There are not that many results on uh, conformal line operators in, in general, but there has been some work on that recently. Uh, and here are two examples of very nice papers. And basically, these people have shown that in some free field theories, there are no non-trivial line operators or surface operators. It's a, a, a somewhat similar subject. 
So for very special cases, there are some bootstrap results constraining which conformal line operators could exist. The third constraint is, uh, I'll put more focus on it, A, because it's newer and I think it's also quite powerful. So you can define an interesting observable, which is natural from a Euclidean perspective. It's hard to explain to condensed matter people how to measure this observable. It's probably related to entanglement entropy, but it's not easy to measure. So the observable is the expectation value of a circular uh, loop uh, line operator, a circular Wilson line. Of course, from a Minkowski perspective, this uh, makes uh, somewhat little sense, but in Euclidean perspective, this is perfectly allowed. And you can ask whether this expectation value is actually scheme independent, uh, whether this is an interesting observable. And the bottom line is that the logarithm of this expectation value may have slight ambiguities. Uh, these slight ambiguities are linear in the radius of the line, in the radius of the circle. And there is also an imaginary ambiguity, which is independent of the radius of the circle, but only in one dimension. And these are associated to counter terms on the line defect. So to get rid of this linear dependence on R, one defines a, slight, a slightly more complicated observable where you act with this differential operator, one minus R dr uh, on the logarithm of the expectation value. And now this is completely scheme independent above uh, one plus one dimensions. I'm ignoring this, uh, I'll be ignoring this imaginary constant because I'm not gonna discuss much one plus one dimensions. So this is an interesting scheme independent quantity which we call the defect entropy. Now, this defect entropy is some sort of count of how many degrees of freedom the impurity has got, but it can also be negative. So it could be that effectively an impurity uh, has negative number of degrees of freedom basically because it repels bulk excitations from it. So there are examples where it's negative. Okay, so this quantity is an interesting quantity because it satisfies a few miraculous properties. Of course, you could cancel the linear in R term in many ways. This is not the only way to cancel the linear piece in R. But this particular way turns out to be extremely natural because you can show, it's a, it's a long argument, which I'm not going to review here, but you can show that using unitarity and locality, this uh, entropy function is then a decreasing function as a function of the radius of the loop. So when you start increasing the radius of this loop, of the circle, this function is monotonically decreasing throughout. And you can think about the radius of the line as some sort of a gadget that remembers the RG scale. So going to long distances is like taking a very large circle. So this entropy function kind of furnishes a monotonic quantity along the RG flow, and it leads to some fun consequences. So first of all, you can, this immediately implies that it's independent of exactly marginal operators. Sometimes line defects have marginal operators, so it's independent of that. And further, it implies something like, um, you know, the entropy of the ultraviolet fixed point of the line defect must be bigger than the infrared fixed point. So I'll show you several applications of this theorem. Of course, this is very well known in condensed matter in one plus one dimensions. Uh, this has been applied extensively for the condo problem and many other problems in condensed matter. This goes back to Affleck and Ludwig, Friedan Konechny, and recently also that made contact, contact with quantum information theory by Cassini, Salazar, Landea, and Toroba. But this is all about one plus one. And the whole point here is that we've, uh, we have an extension to any number of dimensions, so we can start applying similar ideas uh, to line defects in two plus one, three plus one dimensions, Wilson lines, and so on. Okay? So uh, now let me define what I mean by screening before I go on to dynamics and to some examples. So usually screening is uh, a very crude distinction between a perimeter and area law, but here I'm talking about conformal filters, so per area law is not something that uh, is even relevant for the discussion. So there is a much more refined notion of screening. We say that the Wilson line or an impurity is screened if it flows to a trivial impurity or, Wilson or a unit operator. So that means that the defect entropy goes to zero. So I'm gonna say that Wilson lines are screened if they become a trivial line defect in the infrared. Okay, so let me show you the first example of, uh, this will be a line defect in the ON model. So it's not a Wilson line, it's simply in a scalar field theory. So uh, on, in the condensed matters, on the condensed matter side of the story, there is a nice paper by Polkovnikov, Wojta, and Sajdev, and many recent follow-ups. Uh, 
what they do to define a line defect is they take some antiferromagnet and they apply magnetic field, but only on a few sites. It's a staggered magnetic field on a few lattice sites. Because it's only applied on a few lattice sites, it's a local perturbation, and it leads to some impurity that they would like to study the consequences of at long distances. On the quantum filter side, it's uh, the familiar ON fixed point. Um, and the line defect is just where you integrate the scalar field phi, or one component of the scalar field phi, in the direction H. Uh, along, the, along the time direction, but it's localized in space. So just from this uh, theorem about uh, the defect entropy, it's actually an immediate consequence that this defect cannot be screened. This is like an interesting open question condensed matter, which can be settled immediately using monotonicity, because it immediately, f because this, the trivial line defect has S equals zero in the ultraviolet, this is a relevant perturbation, and therefore the defect entropy has to be negative at long distances by virtue of monotonicity. And therefore, this magnetic field cannot be screened, and it flows to a non-trivial conformal defect, uh, as you'll see. Indeed, one paper that we published was to try to compute some exact properties of the line defect that you get for the ordinary Wilson-Fisher fixed point, where G star, G star is the coupling here, where G star is non-zero. Uh, this is the, an exact result in the large end limit, there has been lots of uh, simulations of it recently and also a little bit before, and it seems roughly compatible. So it seems that QFT tools indeed uh, for this particular line defect uh, uh, get the answer pretty close to experiment. And you can generalize this construction to many other models. This is just for the symmetric ON model. The case of G star equals zero is very peculiar, so I just wanted to make a few comments about it. G equals zero is just free field theory. So we're talking about the line operator in just free bosonic field theory, mean field theory. It's a little bit peculiar. What you find is that it doesn't flow to a conformal line defect. This magnetic field perturbation does not flow to a conformal line operator. Actually, it, the flow continues forever, and the defect entropy goes to minus infinity. So the defect entropy is like some power law, which is a positive power of the radius, and it's multiplied by a coefficient, which is negative everywhere below three plus one dimensions. So it just continues to flow forever, and it reaches minus infinity. So it's a never-ending flow. So when I mentioned at the beginning that there could be more exotic scenarios, this is what I refer to. It seems that in some examples, at least in mean field theory, you can flow to forever, essentially, never-ending in a fixed point for the line operator. We believe that this is not possible in theories without a moduli space, but there is no proof. In other words, there should be a lower bound on the defect entropy in healthy field theories. But maybe mean field theory is not healthy for this purpose. OK, what, one more construction, which is a perhaps richer of line defects in ordinary scalar field theories, is more analogous to the condo problem. So let me just walk you through it, and I'll quickly mention some results about it, and then we'll switch to Wilson lines. So you take a scalar field. You take the O3 model. It has three scalar fields. You put it in the pass ordered exponential with some matrices in the, L, in the 2L plus 1 dimensional representation of SO3. So you're essentially coupling, um, you're essentially pu putting a spin S part impurity in the middle of an antiferromagnet where all the other spins are a half. Okay, so this looks a lot like a Wilson line, but it doesn't have a gauge field. So it's an interesting toy model for, for uh, line operators that are more common in high energy physics. Also notice a curiosity that the symmetry of this model is SO3 in the bulk, but this line operator transforms only projectively under SO3 for odd L because it's a half integer spin. And that's okay because line operators don't have to transform under the global symmetry. They can transform under the they can transform only projectively under the global symmetry. And this is a point that was very recently emphasized in this paper. So you can ask whether these uh, line operators are screened in the ON model or in the O3 model or not, as a function of the spin. So uh, our, using the theorem about the defect entropy and various analytical approaches, we claim at the moment that in two plus one dimensions, they are all screened. Uh, sorry, the, we claim that in two plus one dimensions, uh, in free field theory, where G star is zero, they are all, they are all uh, uh, well, they, they, they flow so this is uh, a little bit sick minus infinity, a, a fixed point, but when the coupling is non-zero, we have some concrete prediction 
and uh, it's not yet confirmed by experiment, but the case of G star equals zero, the prediction that we made was already compared in Monte Carlo a, a, few, a few months ago. So one notable thing about this story is that there is a regime where there are two fixed points, so there are two conformal line operators, and then they annihilate and there is no fixed point. This transition is like infinite order, and this was seen already in Monte Carlo. So this was just a quick uh, overview of the existence of uh, conformal line operators in uh, simple Landau Ginzburg models. Now let me switch to something cl uh, closer to high energy physics, uh, which are Wilson lines. So Wilson lines are uh, impurities which carry some charge. Usually we don't discuss, or usually we think that Wilson lines in representations which are carried by dynamical particles are not too interesting, which is of course not correct. Uh, uh, as you'll see. Some of them flow to conformal fixed points, some of them do not. So usually Wilson lines are labeled by a representation of the gauge group, and this is the formula that we see in everywhere. And it seems like when you define Wilson lines, there is no free parameter. This is in contrast to the condom model, where there is no gauge field and the exponent doesn't have to be quantized. And there is a free parameter here on the defect. And that's why there are interesting RG flows and fixed points. When you write the formula for Wilson lines, it seems that there is no free parameter. Everything is quantized because representations are quantized. And you might think naively that Wilson lines therefore become conformal defects. That's why we label Wilson lines by representations. That's not going to be true, as you'll see. To convince you that this is not true, I'll study a toy example, which is just QED. Uh, it's going to be in three plus one dimensions, a uh, free scalar field theory with a quartic interaction and a Wilson line of charge Q. So you can ask, what if the fate of a Wilson line is just a billion QED with a scalar? So here I'm studying a charge Q Wilson line, and there is a dynamical charge one scalar field. Now, you might complain that a billion QED is not a conformal field theory, so it's not quite within the setup that I have studied, but that's actually not an issue. The beta function is so small that you can neglect it, and to do it formally, you have to take some double scaling limit, where the beta function is completely, completely irrelevant for the discussion. And similar double scaling limits appeared in many recent papers. Okay, so the surprise in this business is that for a lot for if you try to compute the anomalous dimension of the local operator phi dagger phi near the Wilson line, it gets strongly renormalized when the Wilson line has a large charge Q. So in the bulk, phi dagger phi is of course a dimension two operator. This uh, conformal filter is nearly free in three plus one dimensions, and the naive scaling dimension is the full is the right answer. But when you bring this operator close to the defect, it gets extremely strongly renormalized, and these are the first few orders in the expansion. And in fact, there is an exact result in the double scaling limit with the square root formula. So what you find is that the operator phi dagger phi actually becomes marginal when e squared q is 2 pi. e squared q is 2 pi in nature, more or less, when the charge is 68, because e squared over 4 pi is 1 over 137. So for Wilson lines of charge 68 or 68 or 68 or 69 or so, uh, this operator becomes marginal, and therefore you must add it to the Wilson line. So the formula that we're used to for Wilson lines is not quite correct. There is a marginal operator that has been neglected that must be added. And now there is a free parameter that can evolve under the renormalization group, and we must analyze the infrared phases of these Wilson lines. And this is the beta function. For, for Wilson lines of charge, which is small enough, there are two fixed points. They then annihilate as you crank up the charge, and then there are no more fixed points. So for Wilson lines in a representation which is too large, there are just no fixed points. It seems it flows to, my, to infinity, very much like in QCD, the coupling flows to infinity. So there is dimensional transmutation, and it flows to a screened trivial defect. In fact, we were able to find the exact solution in this double scaling limit, when you define the boundary conditions of the Wilson line with large enough charge so that it has this phi dagger phi instability, you see that there is a huge cloud which is, goes all the way to the moon. It's exponentially large in the same way that the hierarchy between the proton mass and the Planck scale is so large. So there is a huge hierarchy in the scales, and there is a cloud, a condensate, that goes all the way to the moon, uh, and afterwards the Wilson line is completely screened.
So even in the billion U1 gauge theory, Wilson lines at large, of large enough charge are completely screened, and the ones with low charge are not screened and they flow to conformal defects. These conclusions remain true for all gauge theories in four dimensions, including super young mills theory, n equals four. So n equals four super young mills theory does not have conformal Wilson lines, which are SO6 invariant in arbitrary representations. Many of them disappear, and we believe that at stronger tooth coupling, all of them disappear. In two plus one dimensions, it's an interesting question to ask which Wilson lines exist because it's more experimentally accessible in deconfined critical points. So this is the solution that we have at the moment for QED in two plus one dimensions with an F flavors. Only Wilson lines whose charge is smaller than an F over two exist. In particular, if you ask yourself how the Wilson lines map under particle vortex duality, the answer is probably that there is nothing to be discussed. There are no Wilson lines. It seems that all of them are screened for small values of an F. For churn simon theories, it's very similar to the story that Amit told you a few days ago. They also have uh, a, an, analogous, uh, an analogous deformation of the Wilson line and some are G-flow. So here I'm just going to flesh out some open questions. Of course, this, uh, you, this begs the question of what happens to electric magnetic duality if Wilson lines don't exist in all representations. To, one could also try to make more statements about the planar limit holography, uh, one form symmetry. Maybe one interesting question is to understand the defect entropy, the relation between the defect entropy and the entanglement entropy of some sort. So um, that's more or less it. Thank you. for the great talk. So we have about uh, six minutes for questions. Could you have scale but not conformally invariant uh, Wilson lines? In principle, maybe yes. I don't know. Uh, you might be able to rule it out by some arguments. I have not tried to okay. address this question. I guess you are, you are asking if it's a possible scenario that there would be a scale invariant impurity which is not conformal yeah, as one of the yeah, options here. I don't know if it's an argument in this case. I don't know. I haven't looked at it. Thank you. Do you comment why you think um, this thing might have something to do with entanglement? I didn't quite... Oh, uh, I think that we have a lot of evidence that there is some deep connection between uh, monotonicity theorems and entanglement entropy inequalities. An interesting fact is that uh, in one plus one dimensions, this defect entropy is literally an entanglement entropy. But as Lefkovich, Maldasena have shown, that's not the case in higher dimensions. The entanglement entropy is not exactly the defect entropy. It contains a correction from the one-point function of the energy momentum tensor. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the question of what is the relation between this quantity, which is actually the interesting one for our G flows and entanglement entropy, stands. So, uh, if I understand right, you said that um, when um, that this uh, sort of sick flow that goes on forever and ever to minus infinity, uh, you don't expect it to be possible if the theory has no marginal deformations. Uh, my, uh, we believe we believe that this kind of behavior, that the, an impurity does not end up at a fixed point and just the entropy continues to grow ever more negative, is only possible in theories with a moduli space of vacua. Okay. Like free field theory does. So free field theory has a moduli space of aqua given by arbitrary values of phi. So what physically happens is that you put this external staggered magnetic field, but because there is no potential in the bulk, it just keeps populating the whole bulk and puts the bulk in a new phase. It's like spontaneous breaking everywhere in the... So I believe once in theories with a potential, it should not be possible. Got it. Thanks. So I also have a question about the defect entropy. So you, you gave this interpretation for what it means when it's negative. Yes. But it, does that then mean that there is nothing particularly special for it being zero? Zero is very special. Zero is the value of the unit operator. So if, you, if a Wilson line is screened, then S equals zero. It doesn't mean that S equals zero implies that it's screened. Okay. But if it's screened, then S is equal to zero. And this was very useful for us 
to prove that this uh, defect, which condensed matter people are interested in, must be not screened. There are actually many papers about it in condensed matter, and it's a question. But it's a one-line consequence of the monotonicity theorem. Great. But otherwise, there could have been... Yeah, it could, there, there could, in principle, be non-trivial impurities which are conformal, but have S equals to zero. I can't say that I have... Oh, I know one example, yes. So if you take this... Well, it's a fake... It's a, if you take a free scalar filter in four dimensions, this perturbation is marginal because phi has dimension one. In fact, it's exactly marginal. And you see it in this plot because this coefficient C vanishes exactly in four dimensions. That's a consequence of the fact that I said for exactly marginal operators, the defect entropy has to vanish. So this is an example of a non-trivial defect for non-zero H with vanishing S because it's an exactly marginal perturbation of the trivial defect. Any other questions? Okay, if not, let's think. Oh, there is one. Okay. <laughs> Hold your horses. Okay, we have one more question. <laughs> so far, back. So you showed us this uh, this uh, uh, fixed point structure where you like had two fixed points, then they merge and then they disappear in the complex plane. I suppose. Uh, um, yes, exactly. They disappear yeah. into the complex plane. Yeah. So uh, if this happens, then generically there is a BKT like uh, yes, transition. Yes. Yes. We we claim that this uh, line defect has a BKT like transition. Okay. Um, the, for uh, and it was recently seen in Monte Carlo uh, with some precision. Oh, okay. Just yeah, that, that, but that's the main claim that this is the behavior as a function of the spin of this line. As you increase the isospin, there is a big AT transition. Okay, thanks. Okay, any other final questions? Okay, if not, let's thank Zohar again. <laughs>